take a look at our website. Take a look at our website, uh, bens.org.uk, that's B-E-N-H-S.org.uk, where you can find out more about the society and the benefits of membership. On behalf of Benz, I'd like to thank Olivia and Kieran and the rest of the team of FSC Biolinks for hosting today's programme. It's the fourth in a series of entomological and invertebrate focused presentations uh, that have occurred in this Natural History Live series this year that feature a Ben's guest speaker. Many of these jointly badged and promoted talks were originally scheduled for the 2020-2021 Ben's annual meetings and members days at Oxford University Museum of Natural History. Meetings which, like so many others, have had to be postponed and rearranged because of COVID. And so to today's presentation. I'm delighted that Penny Green agreed to deliver her deferred presentation, NEP Wildland Rewilding and Invertebrates, in this Zoom format. Penny is NEP's ecologist. She manages the NEP safari team, the research students, the volunteers, and she coordinates the biological monitoring of the rewilding project. In her best-selling book, Wilding, The Return of Nature to a British Farm, Isabella Tree, who owns NEP with her husband, Charlie Burrell, describes Penny as a gem. I can understand why. Penny's a boundlessly enthusiastic, energetic and skillful natural historian. And it's my great pleasure to introduce her now. So, Penny Green. Oh, thank you very much, Ian. That's a really lovely introduction. <laughs> and so I'm just going to start um, sharing my screen now. So hopefully everyone will be able to see um, my presentation OK. And so thank you very much for having me along this afternoon. Um, as you can see, I've brushed my hair especially because normally I look like I literally have been dragged through a hedge backwards. So I'm very pleased today to not, not be living in a hedgerow. And today I'm going to be talking about um, the move away from um, intensive farming at NEP and the introduction of some large herbivores and the subsequent rewilding of the land that happened as a result of those animals coming to NEP. I'm going to talk about some of our wildlife successes and, and then I'm going to focus in on our invertebrates uh, as this talk is uh, very much focused on insects. So I expect a lot of you have heard about NEP before. You might have uh, read Wilding by Isabella Tree or you might have even visited yourself and it's a very special place. Um, I absolutely love it at NEP and I love the feeling of you know stepping back in time and being surrounded by all that scrubland, the buzz of insects and the you know bird song and so on. It is a very special place for me and so I love sharing what we're learning at NEP with others. So just to set the scene, um, this is uh, the NEP estate. Um, it's quite a large area, but it's about three and a half thousand acres. So it's about seven kilometres long, which is quite a large area in Sussex to be put aside for nature. Um, and as you can see, uh, the estate is divided up into three areas, uh, mainly because of the roads that run through the estate. So we have, I'm going to talk about these, I'm going to just set the scene, just give you a bit of context. So we've got um, the southern block at the bottom here. Uh, this is a very wild area. This is the scrubland uh, and uh, was taken out of production in 2003. And as you can see on the map there, there's lots of lines that are dividing up the, each field. Uh, each of those fields is about 10 acres uh, big. And um, there's a ditch and a hedgerow around every single one of these fields, which has really provided the template from where the rest of the scrublands come from. It's got all this lovely seed stock that's kind of, you know, coming out uh, of the hedgerows and, and the existing tree lines there to help scrub up the rest of the southern block. We have the middle block, which is also the Repton-esque park. So a Humphrey Repton or his son designed this uh, landscape here, uh, but it does go back to about the 11th century when it was a deer park then and King John used to come hunting in this area. So Repton about 220 years ago redesigned the landscape and it was still a deer park, uh, but it was uh, you know all about sort of having ooh, um, 
a, you know, a fairly wild landscape that people could come and enjoy uh, with existing features uh, such as the, um, the veteran trees and the big water bodies as well. So there's a big mill pond here uh, and a, a river that runs through the estate as well. And this bit of river here has um, seen a river restoration project, about two and a half kilometres of river has been restored. So moving away from the canalised rivers uh, that the Victorians kindly uh, put in for us and uh, re-meandering it, looking back at aerial photographs of what it would have looked like before then. And now we have a, a naturally functioning floodplain, which provides all sorts of wonderful aquatic habitats for all sorts of wildlife and, and um, very, very special for in, uh, invertebrates as well. And then we have, so that area came out of production about 2000, 2001, and went to the rewilding project. And then we have the northern block at the top here, and that was about 2001 to 2002 that that went into the rewilding project. Now, anyone that's visited NEP will know um, about, uh, or have, have read about it, will know about the, the wheeled clay that we're on. So it's a very thick, claggy soil, and we're already sort of slopping around in our welly boots because it's been quite wet at NEP this autumn. So you can imagine um, trying to farm that kind of landscape with um, it, it in the winter, it's very uh, muddy indeed. Uh, and then in the summer, if it's a, a hot summer, we can see uh, the ground drying up almost like concrete and cracking, huge cracks appearing. So I could really sympathise with anyone trying to farm this kind of land because it is hard going. But all these little uh, water lags that you can see through the site here, all these little blue uh, veins running through uh, um, are little floodplain meadows, and they once would have helped get the water off of the farmland, but now are these fantastic um, uh, little aquatic habitats that provide all sorts of wonderful niches for, for invertebrates. We have a hammer pond here and a stream that runs out over the spillway that feeds into the, the river restoration project. So it's a very wet site. What was, what was bad for farming is fantastic for wildlife. So just a very quick history of, of NEP. So they'd seen sort of since the agricultural depression in the 20s, when all of this land was abandoned because it was marginal, that we would have seen scrubland uh, during that time. But a lot of that land was put back into production again um, uh, uh, during the war effort. Everyone was doing their bit uh, for, you know, the, during the Dig for Victory campaign and putting uh, land back into production again. And that's exactly what happened at NEP. And the burrows have been at NEP for about 200 years, uh, farming away with red pole cattle, uh, champion sheep breeds, uh, and all sorts of one other farming going on there. And Charlie took over the estate uh, at the ripe old age of 21, about 30 years ago, and he really wanted to make a, a good go of the farm to try and make it productive. So fresh out of agricultural college, he threw everything at it, pesticides, herbicides, um, uh, fertilizers, you name it, big machinery trying to make it as productive as possible. So there were 600 dairy cows and 2000 acres of arable. Uh, but despite this wall to wall production and ploughing up underneath the parkland trees, which ultimately killed quite a lot of these lovely old veteran trees that were once an important feature of Repton's Park, um, they were still making a loss on the commodity side of the farm. So it's time to do something a bit different. So they were inspired by other rewilding projects in Europe uh, and how you could keep animals uh, in um, sort of large um, herds over large areas, almost like ranching that you would see in Australia or Africa. So they moved away from these monocultures of oilseed rape and wheat and maize to a completely new way of land management uh, that's letting the land breathe and it's fantastic for wildlife. It's much better for the livestock that we're um, growing there and it's really good for the end consumer that eats the meat that's harvested from the project. So rather than it being all about the production, uh, it's about nature and then the byproduct it is the meat that we can harvest from the project. So um, here are some of our lovely large herbivores that are driving the project for us. So in the top left hand corner here, you can see the old English longhorn cattle. And this is a, a wonderful docile breed um, that's a good beef animal, um, but they're very hardy. And like all of the other animals at NEP, they're kept out all year round um, and they're not brought in at night. They're not supplementary fed and they have to make their own living. So the result of these animals having to make their own living is that they um, uh, will be feeding in the hedges, in the willow, in the thorny scrub and on, on grazing on the ground as well. 
And this influences uh, the vegetation structure. So where we've got succession pushing in one direction, it's all of that thorny scrub coming up. These animals are pushing back against it and they've all bringing different um, um, uh, sort of uh, ways of feeding and disturbance factors to the scrubland that influences it in different ways that goes on to make it good for wildlife. So the Old English Longhorn, we have a herd of about 290 and that's divided amongst the three areas that I just showed you on the map. And they're grazing, and as well as grazing, they're uh, doing something called browsing. And that's when they're eating twigs and leaves and bark and those kind of things. So slightly more coarser um, uh, woody stuff. Um, and they're influencing uh, the hedges, what's happening in the hedges and the sallow. And, you know, maybe even self-medicating during the winter on the salicylic acid from the willows. And these are, um, are really replicating as best we can our wild oxen, so our, you know, uh, extinct aurochs, which would have been roaming through our landscape a few thousand years ago. Uh, so we are uh, trying to, uh, we're not trying to go back to a particular point in time, but we're trying to have a nice suite of animals that represent some of the different herds we would have had free roaming in our landscape. So that, that is our modern day aurochs. Then on to the next uh, picture, which is the Tamworth pig. Um, and these are in lieu of the wild boar. So under the Dangerous Wild Animal Act, we're not allowed to reintroduce wild boar without electric fencing. And because of the kind of areas that we're talking about, large areas, it wouldn't be particularly um, efficient to be running an electric fence. So instead of that, we have uh, the Tamworth pig and they're doing exactly the same kind of job as the wild boar. So they're doing lots of rootling where they're turning over the, uh, the soil uh, with their snout, looking for tasty roots and tubers to feed on and grubs and all other sorts of goodies that you might under, under the turf surface but at this time of year they're eating acorns but there's not many acorns this year so they'll be doing a lot more rootling and in the summer they're grazing away on the different grasses and clovers. So we only have about six breeding sows and every year they produce about 20-25 piglets and then those piglets get taken off the project uh, over the winter. So that's our Tamworth sat sow and then we have um, the red deer um, the red deer aren't here in lieu of anyone, they are themselves and the red deer would have been here for many thousands of years before now. We have about 100 red deer across the middle and the southern block. Um, they've just finished their rut, so it's a very dramatic time of year where they're roaring away and fighting and all the ground disturbance that comes with that is really important for all sorts of arable weeds that come up where they uh, sort of uh, run around a lot and create bare soil. Um, and they do a lot of um, heavy browsing. So these were brought in as a heavy hitter. So they're ring barking some of the young trees as they're coming through. So again, they're kicking back against succession, holding it in some kind of dynamic state. And then um, they're also grazing as well in the open pasture areas. We have uh, two herds of Exmoor ponies uh, that come to about 29 individuals. We have a breeding herd in the middle block and a non-breeding herd in the southern block. And um, unlike um, domestic horses, they're very hardy. They're out all year round and they're finding lots of uh, goodies to feed on. Uh, so they're not just grazing, but they're also um, sort of nibbling away on hazelnuts. They're eating roots. They're eating thistle flowers and all sorts of different goodies um, that they're finding to feed on. And again, you see disturbance from them. They kick away at anthills. They make dung piles where they keep going back and uh, placing their dung on top of other people's dung and, and building up there. So good for all sorts of insects. And they're in lieu of the, the tarpan, a wild horse that would have been in our landscape a few thousand years ago. If you look back at cave paintings uh, in France from about 17,000 years ago, they're very similar indeed to, to the tarpan. And genetically, they're one of the closest animals that we have to that wild horse that is now extinct. And at the bottom here, you can see the fallow deer. So the fallow deer were um, brought in by the Normans in this interglacial period, but in previous interglacial periods, they would have been here uh, as a much larger deer than we see here now. Uh, but we have about 400 between the middle and the southern block. And again, they're grazing and browsing and creating disturbance. And all of these animals, you know, they're contributing in the different ways that they feed but also disturbance, uh, the way they carry seeds around in their hooves and trotters and fur, and the way they move nutrients around the site. And all of these we refer to as processes. 
So on most nature reserves would be very much uh, target led. So we know exactly what kind of habitat we're aiming for. Um, you know, you know exactly the kind of management prescription that you want to apply to get back the suites of species that you expect to see for heathland or you know coppice woodland or chalk grassland. You know, we've got ideas in mind of exactly how they need to be managed. But for us at NEP at the moment, we're very much process led. We're driven by these animals and, and the processes that they bring to the project. We don't necessarily have any targets as such, uh, but we're just let, letting the whole thing play out. And we do lots of monitoring and research as we go uh, to see what happens as a result of these animals driving the project along. And so far, we've seen an amazing uh, resurgence of scrub, um, and especially so in, in the southern block, which had several years uh, where it was taken out of production over several years without the animals present. So there's this amazing vegetation pulse, which allowed all of this thorny scrub and willow scrub to get established and for little saplings to get established, too. So in this photo here, we can see an oak sapling that's been protected by um, the bramble and probably a bit of blackthorn and wild rose in there as well. And that thorn acts as a, a natural tree guard to the herbivores. So it's allowing these little trees, these little saplings to get going without being munched by the animals. And we're hoping that these, uh, these trees will go on to be our next open grown oaks of the future. But also we're seeing ash, we're seeing uh, wild service, field maple and all sorts of other trees trees coming out of, of that thorny scrub. And of course, underlying all of this is, is a recovering soil system. And on top of that, you're going to get good life. And we're really excited that in the last couple of years, we've been able to quantify this a bit more. Um, so we've compared uh, our soil at NEP to our neighbouring farmland that's continued farming in the same vein that, that um, NEP was before the rewilding project. We've seen a, double, uh, a doubling in the amount of organic carbon in the soil. We've seen a doubling of the soil microbial biomass. That's all your bacteria and uh, good in the soil that make a functioning soil ecosystem and an increase in fungal biomarkers. So for us, this is really exciting. And this is just a, a couple of little slides to show you a sort of before and after. So if you keep watching, you'll see um, the, the habitats changing, the landscape changing, and you can see how it just gets greener and more lush, and you can guess uh, a lot more full of wildlife as well. There you go. So this is one of the scrapes next to the Green Lane. You may have visited a tree platform there if you've visited before. It's a wonderful place full of dragonflies, but little grebes nesting there and all sorts of lovely um, other things going on there. But overall, we're a landscape of a lot of different opportunities for invertebrates. So we're not giving any uh, preemptive uh, um, pesticides or ivermectins to our cattle or any of the other animals at NEP. If they do get a, um, a heavy burden of worms or um, a liver fluke, what we do is we take the animals out of the system, we treat them with organic um, um, drenches where we can, and then we let it all flush through uh, their systems and then before we put them back into the rewilding project. So it's all very carefully managed to, to minimise the amount of pesticides and ivermectins that are going uh, into the rewilding project. So that allows our, you know, the cattle dung, for example, to be absolutely full of insects because there's nothing in the dung killing them. And that goes on to be good for bats and birds and other species that rely on those insects further up the, the, the food chain. So lots of dung, we've got ancient trees and hedgerows, the little floodplain meadows, lots of open water, wet woodlands as that open water changes, and of course the river restoration project as well. So the hedges, you know, you can you know, only imagine what these used to look like as a farmed uh, landscape hedge. So they would have been flailed with an inch of their life every year. And now we've been able to let them grow out and they're just wonderful. Um, this is a particularly good hedge. This, this one in particular for nightingales. We have about three or four nightingales breeding in this particular hedge um, because it's got this lovely mantle of vegetation along the base there. But as you can imagine, it's great nectar source and pollen source for our pollinators. The old trees support thousands of different insect species uh, and um, the heart rot fungus in them, it, you know, is uh, supporting all sorts of other communities of fungi as well. So um, they're really important. They're islands of longevity in uh, our, our landscape and, and very important. So we cherish our lovely old veteran trees. 
the lags that I was talking about, these little floodplain meadows are really important places for the herbivores to come and drink, but also wonderful for aquatic uh, coleoptera, so beetles and dragonflies. And also the turtle doves love uh, these areas as well. So a lot of our turtle dove territories are based around these lag systems uh, because they need water to be able to produce uh, the crop milk that they feed to their young. And the scrubland itself is absolutely stuffed full of blossom uh, during the spring and the summer. And the lovely thing is we have this sequence uh, of um, nectar sources all the way from February, March time when the willow's coming into flower. Then you've got your blackthorn, hawthorn, wild rose and bramble, and then going into ragwort and fleabane right up until the end of the summer and into the early autumn. So as you can imagine, this is a really uh, important resource for our pollinators. Uh, um, and you can really hear the place buzzing with insects if, if you ever visit. And just recently, we've been really lucky to be working with Queen Mary University of London, and they've actually been able to help us quantify uh, the amount of scrub that we have. We've been using a laser scanning technology called LIDAR to show the change in the veg vegetation. And so um, um, it's really quite detailed and it, it's shown that in 18 years we've gained 1.3 million square metres of scrub just in the southern block uh, at NEP, so in just over a thousand acres. So to give you an idea of how much that is, so for every three square metres that was farmland before, more than one square metre is now scrub. So that's quite a quick recovery. And as you can imagine, the, the wildlife has flooded back into this you know, opportunity uh, of this scrub and all the blossom uh, and you know obviously all the other wildlife that's come back you know for in nesting roosting and so on it's an amazing place my hoping as time goes on as we talk more about uh, carbon sequestration and tree planting we want to show that scrublands can be really productive uh, for providing that natural nursery for, for young saplings coming through uh, but at the same time rather than rows of plastic collars on planted trees that have been grown abroad somewhere and bought lots of pests back with them that we can um, establish trees in a natural way uh, with that scrub supporting them as a natural tree guard and at the same time providing a wonderful habitat for so much wildlife. So a lot of the recording we do at NEP uh, is done by enthusiastic amateur naturalists and we you know we couldn't do it without them. They're absolutely amazing and I'm so delighted to be able to work with these amazing people that have so much knowledge about their different taxonomic groups. And um, we have over the years collected a lot of data. And because we have no targets as, as such, we call them uh, emergent properties or emerging properties. So we've collected uh, over 30,000 records now which is 3,000 uh, species in total, 85 of which are nationally notable and scarce, like this uh, lovely red and black tortoise beetle. We've got 13 species of bats, including the rare Becksteins and Barberstell bats, uh, lots of lovely dragonflies like the scarce chaser, and 30 red list birds during the breeding and uh, winter seasons. Now, all of this data, this is very much a snapshot in time, and I've got a lot of data that I've got to put into my database here at NEP. And so um, hopefully we're going to um, build those numbers up over the next uh, few months as I spend the winter uh, writing up a big review and uh, totting up what we found out so far. We're finding out we're turning into a bit of a national hotspot or and a regional hotspot for a variety of different species. So earlier on, I mentioned turtle dove and nightingale. So turtle dove has seen a 98% decline over 48 years, 82% uh, decline in just 10 years, which is a pretty significant drop for this wonderful species uh, that we're seeing a huge decline in. Uh, across the UK. But we're delighted at NEP that we have um, a pretty stable population of about 20 or so singing males. And that makes up actually a quarter of Sussex's turtle dove population. So uh, that's quite remarkable, really. This year, we counted 30 nightingale territories um, just in the southern block and actually 40 across the whole estate. And we're a bit of a hotspot for cuckoo and lesser whitethroat, the lovely um, uh, bird that we have breeding and the scrub structure and age must be just right for the lesser whitethroat because we have about 60 breeding pairs of them in the, the, the southern block. I'm going to talk about all the insects uh, separately in a moment. 
So just to give you a breakdown, um, we've collected 3,000 uh, um, different species records and um, of them, 1,800 of them are invertebrates. So it's a significant chunk uh, of the records that we hold at NEP are uh, invertebrate based. And um, there you can go, you can see a lot of uh, different lovely uh, species we've recorded at NEP. Uh, and if we break that down a bit further, we can see um, the different uh, groups. So you can see, um, for example, dragonfly, we have 26 different species, Hymenoptera, 94, uh, jumping into Lepidoptera, we've got 565, uh, grasshoppers, crickets and allies, we have 11. So I think there's probably a bit more work to be done there. Uh, true bugs, we have 144. Flies, 178, mollusks, 36, spiders and allies, 129, and uh, a whole host of other um, bits and bobs that tot up to 24. So quite a significant um, makeup of that pie chart there is a coleoptera. And that's probably due to Graham Lyons spending quite a lot of time at net. There's Graham on the right, and he's been helping us um, do invertebrate surveys. So I started at NEP in 2015, and um, a lot of baseline surveys had been done at the beginning of the project in 2000. But unfortunately, um, you know, they weren't able to do everything. So since I've started, we've been able to think about what other baselines we might, might want to set. And also just think about that it's never too late to start a baseline. Um, just go for it. You have to kind of take these opportunities. So in 2015, we got a bit of an idea of um, what uh, species um, we have, uh, uh, invertebrate species we have at NEP. So we got Graham uh, coming every month from April through to September and doing some active searching uh, across the, the, um, the whole of the project. Um, so actually sort of using a net, turning over logs, pond dipping, beating, uh, looking for lots of different insects in different situ situations. So it had to be repeatable so it could be uh, done again and compared. And in the first lot of surveys in 2015, we recorded 567 species, 6% of, of those species uh, with some kind of conservation status. Last year, Graham redid the survey, uh, so it was five years later, and we recorded 656 species uh, with 7% of species uh, with a status. So really interesting, you know, as well as helping to build up our species list for NEP, it's actually showing us what's going on with the habitat as well. And actually last year we suffered a huge drought at NEP, so that probably wouldn't have helped uh, the, the species totals there because some vegetation was right down to the ground and dried, uh, dry to the bone. Uh, so we recorded some uh, wonderful species, uh, new for West Sussex ground bug, a couple of them were picked up by Graham, a uh, beetle that had been recorded in Sussex for 50 years until 2020, a uh, nationally scarce beetle and a national scarce spider amongst lots of other lovely species. But as well as the structure surveys, we have um, lots of visitors coming to NEP, including uh, the Dipteris Forum. So Martin Drake came and he was very excited to find this new Dolica podid fly uh, which had uh, he'd found in a kind of poached wet area so it needs kind of poached clay soils and of course we have lots of that and we have cattle that do the poaching for us and so um, this beautiful emerald green uh, fly was spotted uh, along with another species that was pretty rare as well so Martin was quite pleased so that is new to Britain so it's not all about the big exciting stuff like butterflies and moths it's about the little stuff too. This year we uh, discovered a really active colony of this, this nationally rare bee fly, Villa Singulata. It was uh, first recorded in Sussex uh, just five years ago and we found this amazing colony and uh, with lots of active females and what the females do, so uh, the larvae are parasitic and what the, the, um, the females do is they uh, dab their abdomen in the sort of dust to get sand and grit on their sticky eggs and it gives a bit more weight to the eggs and then uh, they fly around and find their host um, species nest and they flick those heavy like almost like little bombs flicking those eggs into the, the, the burrows of their host um, host larvae. Uh, and then when, once the eggs hatch out, uh, the, the larvae consume their host larvae uh, and then go on to be adults, pupate and go on to be adults. So quite a gruesome life cycle there, um, but really great to see these guys in action. They're very beautiful, uh, uh, golden fur on, on their abdomen there. 
Uh, we also found Rose Chafer at NEP uh, this year as well for the first time and Southern Migrant Hawker uh, with its beautiful um, azure blue um, eyes. So absolutely lovely to, to see other species uh, not necessarily being picked up during surveys, but being picked up by volunteers that come and help manage our footpaths and that kind of thing, talking to visitors are spotting all sorts of wonderful wildlife too. And um, we often find insects in places you wouldn't expect them. So uh, we do a lot of bird ringing at NEP. So it's a bit of a jump from insects to birds, but I'll come back to insects in a minute. So during the autumn, we're doing a lot of ringing. Um, we're um, getting um, birds as they're migrating through, we're catching them in our mist nets, and we're putting a little metal ring on their leg that has a unique number on it. And it's really interesting to see as the species of bird that are coming to utilize the scrub, you know, feeding on the berries are bountiful at this time of year, and also the insects in the scrub as they fatten up uh, for their migration south. And about 40% of the birds that we catch during the autumn are black caps, uh, as you can see on the right there. But every now and again, we're able to catch house martins, uh, big flocks of house martins, just as they're getting ready to leave. And we're normally able to lure down the, the juveniles, um, maybe not so much so the adults. And there's a little metal ring. And there are these delightful little furry feet, which are, are quite sweet. But what comes with a house martin is something quite gruesome. And that's uh, this horrible flat fly. <laughs> Some people might like them, but I don't, especially not when they go up the arms of my jumpers <laughs> and down my trousers. Uh, so we all got home after that ringing session uh, to find lots of these scuttling out uh, from, from our rucksacks uh, and uh, jumpers from that day. So we saw them for a few days after. Um, so it's not always about the, the structure surveys, it's about insects that you might find uh, uh, in other places too, sometimes down your trousers. And so, um, so we recorded 56 different species of, of mollusk here. And in that bottom picture, there's Martin Willing, who heads up um, the uh, British Conchological Society and is actually a Sussex mollusk recorder. And uh, the reason they're laughing so much is, is Martin was in such a rush to go meet his in Charlie, who owned the estate. He actually fell in a ditch and got rather wet. And um, that day we recorded uh, a lot of different species, but um, most notably were the, the size of the swan mussels that you can see in the top right hand corner of the photo there and um when the um the hammer pond had been drained down in the past um uh, the pigs had somehow cottoned on to the fact that there might be some food in, in the hammer pond so they sloshed about in the mud at the bottom of the hammer pond and found the, these lovely big swan mussels that can take decades to grow and um they worked out how to sort of open them up very carefully and eat the the muscle inside so these poor mussels that had taken all this time to, to grow were being munched by our Tamworth pigs and as soon as the water levels came back up again uh, you'd think that the Tamworth pigs would have moved on but actually they remembered about those tasty mussels and you could sometimes see them going underwater diving like hippos looking for those mussels to chomp on. Uh, dragonflies we have a lot of structured surveys for these um, around um, at the river restoration project and um, we have a huge uh, a really amazing colony of white legged damselfly we have significant numbers of scarce chaser down in the bottom right hand corner there and I really like the scarce chaser because if you can see those black marks on its abdomen there these are actually mating scars almost like notches on the bedpost as it were so hopefully this male scarce chaser has been contributing to the future generations of scarce chaser at NEP this year we got um, some good numbers of willow emerald which are just making their way across Sussex. In the last few years they've been establishing themselves and I was really surprised um, when out of Graham uh, we found a small red damselfly. Uh, I wouldn't have expected to, to find one of those at NEP. I'm not sure where it came from but it was, it was very exciting to see one of those along with golden ringed uh, dragonfly and also the southern migrant hawker. So it's 26 different species of dragonfly recorded at NEP. Um, moths, so I'm a bit of a moth myself, um, so I spend lots of time outside looking for day flying moths, but also using uh, sort of pheromone lures to, to lure in uh, species like the red tipped clearing and the lunar hornet moth that you can see on the right hand side there. And uh, we also do a bit of um, 
leaf mining. So it's not always about using light traps. It's doing other fun things in the field. So we go around in, at this time of year and we're looking for signs of the larvae of, of some of the micro moths that spend their time in leaves. Uh, in particular, uh, I love seeing the hedge cosmet, Cosmoptrix zyglorella, uh, which you find on hop in hedges. And it's almost like little, it's a, if you're looking out for it, look out for little kind of high fives um, that they're giving you from the leaf. So it's quite a nice, easy one to spot these little high fives nice nice one to remember so we've got about 527 species recorded i've got a big um, notebook full of lots of other moth records to put in so hopefully that's that species list is going to increase dramatically this winter uh, two particular moths of note uh, rush wainscot so this is a species that's confined to five areas in the uk it's in danger of extinction in sussex so there's very few sites for it but the larval food plant plants are ones that we find readily at NEP. Um, and it, we knew it had been recorded at NEP in 2005 by someone, uh, Tim Freed, uh, who was doing um, some moth surveys for us then. Uh, so I've kind of had it as my life mission since being at NEP to try and find it again. And after several failed attempts, we finally caught it in uh, 2017 and not again since actually on the hammer pond. So um, yeah, really nice species to see. And also slow carpet, another rare moth um, that is confined to South and East England. It's in serious danger of extinction in West Sussex, uh, where we've been carrying out some other surveys with butterfly conservation. Um, so it really needs uh, mature stands of blackthorn. Uh, normally unmanaged hedges are pretty good for them too. So we've been putting light traps out regularly, going out dusking, as you can see me with my net in the photo bottom right there uh, around these kind of hedges that have got the you know especially when they're in blossom so that time of year it was quite a cold spring this year so not so many caught um, but larval food plant plant is uh, solely blackthorn it had been recorded last at, at NEP in 1995 and again after several failed attempts we finally caught it last year but not uh, from looking for, for, for uh, you know using nets and torches or looking in our light trap we actually found it when um, I had my clipboard in front of me doing a nightingale survey in April last year and my head torch lit up my clipboard a survey sheet and all of a sudden a little uh, moth fluttered in and luckily Dave my husband had a pot with him always has a pot with him don't leave home without them quickly managed to snare that uh, moth because we both thought oh my god that looked like a slow carpet and sure enough it was and then another one was caught the same night by a colleague who runs a moth trap at his home at NEP so in two different places we know we had slow carpet so hopefully a breeding colony and we caught three more this year uh, two were um, by dusking with a net and torch and one was in a uh, very low watt uh, for four watt LED um, uh, uh, moth trap and it was the only moth in the trap because it was frosty overnight but it was a good quality moth so I'll definitely be trying that again next year. Butterflies, uh, so 62 different species have been recorded in Sussex since uh, butterfly recording began. 52 species were uh, recorded in the Sussex Butterfly Atlas in 2015 and 37 different species have been recorded at NEP. Now we do lots of butterfly transects and we've shown on the transects we've almost doubled uh, the number of uh, species that we're finding on those, those transects, including lots of uh, post rewilding colonists. So we've got marbled right on the right hand side, small heath in the middle, and Essex skipper over on the, the left hand side there. Uh, but one of the jewels in our crown is, of course, the purple emperor. So this is a, a pretty feisty uh, big butterfly uh, that's very territorial. It's quite characterful and definitely worth coming to NEP to see them if you've not seen one before. So we noticed that something exciting was happening with Purple Emperor. So we started monitoring them on a transect and we could see we were getting pretty close to uh, the highest ever day tally in the UK in 2015. But a bit of a dip in numbers in 2016 and then we exceeded the best national one day count in 2017 with 148 purple emperors seen in a day but of course that was all blown out of the water in 2018 when we recorded 388 in a day which is just remarkable and I remember how distracting that was in 2018 when I was out trying to do other survey work to constantly be seeing purple emperors all around me and you can't help but stop and watch them because they're such a wonderful uh, beastie. So hopefully you can hear the sound on this. This is I'm jumping to the pigs now because 
Um, the pigs really are uh, the, a, a keystone species at NEP for species like the turtle dove, but also the purple emperor. So where the pigs uh, do this rootling, they're making this nice substrate for um, sort of very rude eaters, aren't they? <laughs> very noisy. Uh, they're creating this perfect substrate for willow to get grown. So that wet soil that's been opened up by the pigs provides a perfect area for, for sallow to set seed and start growing. And the sallow is um, the food plant of the purple emperor caterpillar. So all of this new growth of sallow is, is providing a wonderful opportunity for uh, what was considered in the past to be a woodland species. Uh, whereas now we're seeing, you know, in a scrubland, the purple emperor ab absolutely thriving. Another butterfly that seems to be doing uh, particularly well, again, probably one of the best sites in the UK for the brown hair streak. Uh, so they're quite hard to record as an adult, but what we do is egg counting. So these lovely little sea urchin like eggs uh, found on blackthorn suckering gro growth. <coughs> And we noticed walking the same transects for the same amount of time every year, we saw this huge increase of about 1600% of eggs found in an hour. And in 2017, we had a huge explosion of brown hair streak adults uh, seen nectaring, particularly on the flea bane, which is a favoured uh, um, nectar source for them. So really nice to see these doing well at NEP. Now onto dung beetles. Um, so uh, we had a wonderful um, master student, uh, Sarah Brompton, came and did some dung beetle surveys for us and compared them to nearby organic farms. And as you can see by the totals there, uh, organic is good, but it's still not as good as rewilding. And we had over 11,000 dung beetles recorded in during her sampling session uh, uh, that, that year. So that's quite remarkable. And we're just getting to grips really with what's happening with dung beetles. But we were really particularly excited to find um, the violet door beetles, Geotrupes mutata, which is a nationally notable species. And it hadn't been recorded in Sussex um, uh, for 50 years. And we found it at NEP a few years ago. And every year since we found more of them. And now in the Southern Block, we seem to have a thriving uh, colony uh, of this wonderful big uh, dung beetle. And again, no um, ivermectins going into the cattle means uh, that it can thrive in, in those, those uh, dung pats um, all, all over Southern Middle and Northern Block. And hopefully we'll start seeing that moving into other parts of the estate before long. Uh, we buddied up with uh, Back from the Brink and Bug Life and Bat Conservation Trust uh, for a big Ancients of the Future project. It's been run at several sites over the UK. We were very lucky to be one of those sites. And it meant that Graham Lyons could come back again and do some interception traps, uh, run some interception traps on our older trees. Uh, and he was looking for saproxylic invertebrates. Now, saproxylic invertebrates are species that rely on deadwood for some part of their life cycle. And uh, really interesting, you can put these intercept, uh, interception traps up and where these uh, beetles and other uh, deadwood species are flying around uh, in and out of the tree area, they'll get caught in one of these sort of see-through veins and then pop down into the, the funnel below. And we go around and collect up the specimens once a week. Uh, so uh, Graham managed to um, find all sorts of wonderful uh, species. Uh, so he found 252 species in, in total. Uh, 47 of which had some form of conservation status and 101, and 101 of those species were saproxylic, so they're deadwood invertebrates, uh, which brought a net total of saproxylic invertebrates up to 129. Now this makes us uh, number 11 in the UK for uh, best sites. Uh, for, for these deadwood invertebrates. So this was very exciting for us. And with the Back from the Brink project, another important thing we were looking at is actually identifying ancients of the future, hence the, the name of the, the project. So we were identifying species and uh, individual trees that would be particularly good uh, uh, veteran trees in the future. So we're not going to see uh, the fruition of this hard work, but we hope that in a few hundred years time, these guys will go on to big, big giants that support, you know, some of these saproxylic invertebrates, some of the bats and birds that thrive in, in this kind of habitat. So Jamie, our woodsman at the time, uh, went out, identified these trees and haloed around them. So took out any other smaller trees that might be competing for nutrients and light to really give them a boost on their way to being a veteran in the future. 
And just a couple of others, just to sort of uh, finish up really, is just to talk about other exciting projects going on outside of the rewilding project at NEP. Uh, one of which is the NEP Regenerative Farm, which is really, really exciting uh, because we want to show you that regenerative farming can be productive and um, economically viable, as well as the rewilding project. And uh, this started off this year, we've got a new farm manager, that's Russ, you can see in the photo there, and he's come from the Pasture Fed Livestock Association, um, and what he wants to do is recover our soils in land around the rewilding project, taking back pony paddocks and sheep fields uh, back in hand. So we're not going to be growing any arable, because we know the clay soil is not particularly kind to, to arable, but we are going to have a suckling herd of Sussex cattle some of which you can see in the photo there, using no fence collars, so we don't have to have so much fencing up. Um, so those collars restrict where they can go and we can move where they go on a daily basis. So we're using uh, mob grazing, so every day or every other day that the herd gets moved on, we've got about 30 cattle in that herd now. Uh, so they're feeding away in those areas and then moving on to literally moving on to pastures new the next day. But where they've trampled and urinated and dunged the day before, that all gets brought back into the soil by dung beetles and worms. And then that goes on to be good for the rest of the ecosystem. So out of the 40 fields in that regenerative farm, eight of them are going to be survey fields. And we've done our baselines this year and we've had Graham doing invertebrates and vegetation surveys. We've been doing butterfly uh, uh, transects and bumblebee transects with the bee, um, bee walks with butterfly, uh, Bumblebee Conservation Trust. Uh, we've been looking at dung beetles. That's what you can see in the top right hand corner. There's a nice dung uh, in a kitchen towel. <laughs> so it's fun preparing them. And we collect the specimens underneath and we can see what dung beetles we've got. And we're doing bird surveys and brown hair streak egg hunts and all sorts of fun things to get local people engaged with the regenerative farm and get people excited about this new way of farming uh, at NEP and um, further afield. And we're hoping to run some workshops once we're a bit more established in that. So that's been funding the baseline surveys for them. And also we're rewilding the walled garden just next to the castle in the Repton Park area. And before the rewilding of the wild garden, again, we wanted to get some um, baseline surveys done. And uh, again, uh, Graham was able to come and help with that as long uh, as well as um, some of the other surveys I was able to run myself, including very uh, tiny four watt LED uh, moth trap. So I'm just catching species just within the garden. We're not pulling them from anywhere else, hopefully. And we're getting all sorts of uh, lovely species being found there. Having said we're not pulling species from anywhere else, we've got Jersey tiger and olive tree which were both uh, migrants, so maybe passing over when the light was on. Uh, but we found small red-eyed damselfly, a uh, little um, a group of them um, flying around a tree in the garden. So that's quite interesting. I'm not sure why they were doing that, but it's the first time we'd recorded that species at NEP. And bee wolf, the, the very cool bee wolf, uh, was found in the garden too. So it's a very exciting time for NEP uh, with all these new projects coming online and lots more wildlife hopefully to turn up. And of course, um, the nice thing to end on is the beavers. So last year we, we reintroduced beavers to NEP. Unfortunately, uh, we were, were fortunately we we're part of a national trail uh, trial to uh, see if we can have a semi-enclosed beaver pen. But unfortunately, uh, that semi-enclosed pen didn't work, and they both escaped fairly promptly. Uh, so I had a bit of an emotional roller coaster trying to catch them back up again over over the last winter. Now we're just rebuilding a much smaller, completely enclosed pen, and we're hoping that um, later on this winter we'll have beavers back at NEP and I'm hoping some of the habitats that they create as they build their dams and uh, lodges and uh, create those lovely pond systems will provide a whole load more of interesting habitats for insects. So thank you very much for listening. If you've enjoyed the talk today, you might like to tune into my podcast, which is the NEP Wildland podcast, where I go out in the field um, so you can hear all the birds singing and the, the bumblebees buzzing uh, with specialists. And we talk about all the different things they're studying at NEP. So it's much more fun than reading a report um, just to hear these specialists with their enthusiasm for NEP and their taxonomic groups. It, it's really wonderful. So do tune in um, and, and listen on Spotify or iTunes or on our website. Great. I'm going to hand back now. Stop sharing. There you go. And I think we've probably got some time for some questions, I hope. Thank you, Penny. Um, yeah, wonderful talk. And it's amazing to see the variety of species that you've got, you've got at NEP. Um, we've definitely got some time for questions, which Kieran um, from BioLinks 
is going to be hosting those. So um, I can hand over to Kieran for some questions. Yeah, we've, we've had loads, Penny. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to be cheeky and I'm going to jump the queue and I'm going to ask a question myself, which won't surprise anybody that knows me. Have you, have you done any recording of earthworms? We have done some recording of earthworms and we actually had a surprising number and I can't remember off the top of my head, uh, but we have had Emma Sherlock down from the Natural History ah, Museum and I really hope uh, she's going to come back again soon uh, to do some more um, because we're really keen to find out a bit more how earthworms recover in a uh, rewilded landscape, you know, because, uh, you know, in the past that intensive farming would have really not done them any favours. And I don't know that they're that quick to recolonise. So it's something we're very interested in. And of course, they're very important ecosystem engineers as well, aren't they? They are. At the end of this call, we'll have a chat and we'll book in a date and me and Emma will both come down. Brilliant. Love the sound of that. <laughs> um, I, yeah, it's an excuse for me to get on the site without having to pay as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what it's like. Sounds good um, to me. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Questions. I've got to prioritise some of these now. Um, so we, yeah, there's one that's actually just come in that I, I think is quite interesting. Uh, Tina's asked, is there any any scope for the inclusion of browsing sheep, for example, Shetlands as large her herbivores and similar systems? And I suppose on the back of that, if not, why why would you not use sheep? Um, so sheep weren't part of our um, historic landscape. You know, they they were very much a species of Asia. Uh, so it's actually humans that have moved in there, where to, to the UK. Whereas in the past we would have had uh, the kind of deer that we see here now. We would have had wild oxen. We would have had the wild horse. And we would have had wild boar. So we're trying to emulate um, species that would have been here naturally in the past. That, that's why we don't include sheep. Okay. Um, and somebody else has asked, do you have much interaction with the farms around you, with your neighbours, um, regarding the work that you're doing? And Ab them? Absolutely. Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, uh, anyone that's read Izzy's book, uh, Wilding, will know um, that it wasn't always happy times for the neighbours. Um, it was, you know, not you know seeing the landscape change from a farm lands landscape to something that considered some people considered to be messy uh, was tricky uh, but now we actually facilitate the upper ada farmer group um which is a wonderful thing so it's bringing a whole host of uh, farmers from around our area together we're not necessarily talking about rewilding but we're talking about themes in common so identifying for example how to manage veteran trees for wildlife planting hedges talking about uh, soil health uh, water quality all of those kind of things so we're, we're we're part of a landscape you know where we've got regenerative farming got lots of other wildlife friendly farming going on and we've got um rewilding as well so we're, we're part of a diverse farmed landscape in one way or another so um they're you know much more on board now and, and we've got this wonderful dialogue happening with them and, and that you know there's some fantastic stuff going on out there brilliant we've had a couple of questions about recording so i might combine these mm into one so adrian's asked what field app or apps do you use for recording and surveying and fiona has asked do you submit all of your records to the local environmental record center which i'm guessing is sussex biodiversity record biological biodiversity record center, record center. Biodiversity yeah, so record center. <laughs> So I must say, I'm a bit of a dinosaur. I love my notebook. So I have, um, I've got them here. I've got my notebooks um, and uh, that's my life in there. Um, I don't really use um, any field apps myself, uh, but I use technology for recording. So I use the drone a lot uh, and that kind of thing. Um, so then I will go back and I have Recorder 6 is my database on, on my computer and I use QGIS as well to keep all of my records. Uh, I use Recorder 6 uh, because the Sussex Biodiversity Records Centre does and actually I used to manage the Sussex Biodiversity Records Centre so species and habitat data management is a, a key thing for me and doing those data exchanges is key as well. Well I'm a bit behind so <laughs> this winter I've really got to get up to date on, on my data entry and getting all of those records off but also gleaning the data that has gone to Sussex Biodiversity Records Centre through apps like iRecord, which is fantastic, uh, and BirdTrack and those kind of things. So um, all of those records go to SXBRC. And then when I do my data exchange with them, I get the NEP records back that I don't already have. So really important to be working with your local environmental records centre. Big plug there for them. 
Yeah, there's a question in the chat that I know is answered by my colleagues, but I think just for the purpose of everybody else, we'll ask it anyway. Um, Gillian was asking what a baseline survey is. Is it one that you start that year and then all other surveys from then on can be compared to it? Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, ideally, you'd be doing your baseline surveys before any changes have happened. So you've got the real baseline, you know, it's at its lowest ebb, probably, especially if it's coming, you know, from an intensive farmed landscape. So you've got your real baseline. And from that, you can really, you know, have your headline success stories as, as the years go on, you can see what turns up as a result, what new species are colonising as the years go on, and the kind of changes that you're seeing. So everything from botanical transects, through to you know moth trapping butterfly transects you know you name it we try to do everything as best as we can uh, but uh, of course ad hoc recording is also very important to help you learn because there'll be species that you don't pick up on your transects and your quadrats that, that are out there as well so um uh, sometimes you know you might be a bit too late to set up a baseline like I said um, for example the invertebrate surveys so you know that was you know that was several years after the rewilding project had already started but it's never too late to get a snapshot in time and then you've got something to compare it to going forward. Yeah I mean you could spend 20 years doing baseline surveys before you even start the conservation. Exactly. <laughs> it's obviously you don't want we don't want to wait that long so yeah brilliant right i'm going to end it with quite a tricky one <laughs> penny uh <-oh. laughs> a very topical one and marie's asking what measures are being taken to ensure that this special landscape is resilient to future climate change risks such as increased frequency or intensity of drought in the summer flooding in the winter phenological shifts etc well so the rewilding uh, you know it, it, by its very nature is hopefully going to become more resilient as time goes on as the soil health recovers uh will be you know there'll be more moles and worms and dung beetles in the, and um, making more air pockets in the soil that will make it more able to take heavy rainfall events uh so that the the infiltration rates will be much slower um and then um very faster and then things like the sallow and thorny scrub you know that helps intercept rainfall as it's coming down so rather than washing straight off the land it's being absorbed into those the scrub and then into the ground as well so that that's you know two things that have, have naturally happened as a result of the rewilding project that are hopefully going to help with climate change um so of course we've, we've got a uh, lots of nectar and pollen sources for our pollinators uh, as time goes on you know they're struggling massively uh, potentially with, with climate change uh, we have the river restoration project that's helping to hold on to a lot more water now uh, because we've put the meanders back in. So rather than it rushing through on a canalised uh, river during heavy rain events, uh, you know, we were holding on to that water for much longer as well. So they're just a few of the things. But also, you know, thinking about um, species that are on the northern edge of their range that are just coming into the UK, we're providing a really complex mosaic or a kaleidoscope of different habitats that, you know, these species can utilise as they're arriving on our shores because we're not far off the south coast. You know, there'll be a lot of species that, you know, will probably do well in that kind of habitat and actually we find quite a lot of heathland species at NEP maybe just because of the, having a similar structure um, to, to, to the vegetation you might find on NEP, the heathland but not necessarily the same species so um, you know we're hopefully we're providing you know a space where those um, um, invertebrates and other species you know as they're moving north can can um, um, you know move in and uh, on their way through really so you know that's just a few things off the top of my head it's a very complicated question we could talk about it for a long time. <laughs> uh, th thank you very much for, pe for that Penny and thank you very much for a great talk I'm going to hand back to Ian quickly. Thanks, Karen. Uh, Penny, thank you so much. As always, so enthusiastic, so informative. What a wonderful project you're involved with and driving forward. And, and thank you so much for holding on to your deferred talk for such a long time. It's been great to see you today in action. Thank you so much indeed on behalf of the British Entomological and Naturalist Society. Absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. And hopefully that enthuses more people to get out and recording and also to visit your nearest rewilding project.